you're always working for someone, doesn't matter who it is at mm -hmm. the end of the day. And you take pluses and minuses from those individuals and you say to yourself, hey, if I ever get the chance to lead, if I ever get the chance to be in a position, I'm gonna do things differently. I'm gonna, you know, treat subordinates this way and not this way. Mm -hmm. And so you're you're constantly learning. Well, hey, everyone, welcome to Framework Leadership, a podcast about principles and ideas you can use today to take your leadership to the next level. I'm your host, Kent Engel, president of Southeastern University. And I'm your co-host, Michael Steiner, vice president for innovation. And we're excited to introduce our guest for today's show, Secretary Chad Wolf. Chad serves as America First Policy Institute's executive director, chief strategy officer, and the chair for the Center for Homeland Security and Immigration. He served in the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and has over 10 years of experience working in the private sector. Uh, Chad holds several awards, including the U.S. Secretary of Transportation 9-11 Medal, the U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security Distinguished Service Medal, and the National Intelligence Distinguished Service Medal. Wow, it's such an honor to talk with you today, Mr. Secretary. Well, guys, thanks for having me on. I know that's a mouthful, so I appreciate you running through it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I want to open up our conversation by discussing uh, America First Policy Institute. This is a nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan research institute that exists, exists to advance policies to put the American people first. Tell us more about the organization and, and your position and what you're hoping AFPI will accomplish in the next few years. Yeah, I appreciate that. We're an organization that's a little bit more than probably about 650 days old now. We uh, started after the Trump administration. And what we decided to do was we looked at the policies of the four years of the Trump administration where we put Americans first. That was a common theme throughout those four years, whether you're looking at economic policy, education policy, healthcare policy, national security, or homeland security, and then everything in between. And what we saw is that most Americans, the vast, vast majority of Americans like the policies uh, when you put Americans first and you think mm -hmm. about their interests before uh, big business or, or big tech or big pharma or even, you know, our some of our uh, closest friends and allies uh, across the across the pond and mm -hmm. overseas. What do you do with Americans and how do you put them first? So we decided to continue that movement that really began under President Trump didn't start there. It certainly had a kickstart there um, and decided to continue that movement here in the uh, in the nonprofit world. So you'll find about 140, 150 of us now working at the Institute. We've got 20 different policy centers uh, ranging, again, from healthcare policy, education policy, economic policy uh, to national security mm -hmm. and homeland security and talking about the issues of today that are matter not only at the federal level, but also the state level. Right. A lot of the innovation and a lot of the solutions that we are seeing in the public policy sector are coming from the states. Mm -hmm. So we're active in about 16 states and are increasing every every day. Love it, love it. And you know, a lot of our students and, and audiences listen to this podcast, they're in that um, kind of pre, uh, they're entering their first kind of career in college. Yeah. What would you recommend they need to be keeping in mind over the next couple of years? How do they need to be positioning themselves? We hear a lot of different things about the economy and wars and everything. What is the main things that they need to be keeping in focus going forward for the next couple of years? Well, it certainly depends on what they want to do mm -hmm. after college. Uh, if you want to go into uh, you know, public policy, you want to serve your government, but you don't want to go into the military, so you want to give back, again, whether that's at the local, state, or federal level, I would say just kind of be a student of the world. Um, I think in, in college specifically, you can get very zoned in, mm -hmm. right? You can be in a sure. silo of, of your studies, maybe even your, your circle of friends and, and whatever else you might be doing. I would say now is the time to kind of take a larger look at mm -hmm. what's going on in the world and the country and find what you're really passionate about. I'm sure you're studying. I'm sure they're studying about issues that they care about, mm -hmm. whether it's, again, economics or, or whatever it might be. But think long term. What, what do you want to see yourself doing in 5, 10 and 15 years from now? And then what motivates you? And mm -hmm. I think the only way to really get to know that and get to know yourself mm -hmm is really start learning about what else is going on in the world and uh, in the U.S. specifically. Yeah. And I think there it'll start, you'll start to hone in and you'll start crossing off mm -hmm. things that you're like, well, that's interested in, mm -hmm. but I really have no passion to spend all my yeah. time doing that, right? So you you block off or you you sort of wall off certain issues, but then you open your mind and your, and your world to a whole set of other issues that you're saying, well, I, I care passionately about that. Mm. Now, how can I make a difference and where can I get involved and where can I make a career out of that? 
I think that starts mm -hmm. to open itself up over time. Are there certain trends you guys are seeing at America First Policy Institute? Do you think that you think are going to impact all Americans, no matter what career they're entering in, that should be affecting us over the next couple of years? Well, I think you certainly have to start with the economics, right? That's mm -hmm. what drives right. what we see in polling yep. after polling is that most Americans care about the economy, they care about how it impacts them every single day. Um, and so whether that's the inflation that we're seeing, mm -hmm. um, that's the, you know, the green economy that we hear a lot about, mm -hmm. I think that is kind of the driving force. I would say second is really, it, it may be a little bit beyond those that are mm -hmm. maybe graduating right now, but it, it has to do with parents mm -hmm. right. and, right. and, and what their children are being taught or not being taught in school. And that's at the, you know, anywhere from the, the K through, uh, 12 and, and then obviously the higher education piece. So. Those two continue, it doesn't matter who we talk to, it doesn't matter what issues we're dealing mm -hmm. with, those two issues, both the economy and education, and then specifically parents mm -hmm. and parents being involved in their in their children's education are, are two or three big issues that we continue to see over and over and over again. Obviously national security and stuff, what's going on in the world around us and some of the, the crisis Mm -hmm. uh, that we see uh, confronting us also take, you know, we also see some some high marks and polling there as well. But I think it, it always usually comes down to the economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Now, prior to joining uh, AFPI, you served as the Secretary of U.S. Department of Homeland Security, the third largest federal deport department in the U.S. government. And before that, you worked in the private sector, worked on Capitol Hill. Tell us about those experiences and, and what leadership lessons you learned along the journey. Well, those are, are, are some yeah. difficult assignments and, yeah. and different assignments in their own regards. I came up uh, to Washington, D.C. after graduating uh, with an undergraduate degree and, and worked on Capitol Hill, then went into the Department of Homeland Security shortly after 9-11. This was during the, the Bush administration, then left that, went into the private sector, as you indicated, for a little bit over a decade and then went back into, into DHS service for all four years of the, of the Trump administration. A lot of lessons learned there. A lot of things uh, I would do the same as I did, and a lot of things I would probably do different as well. I think from a leadership perspective, I think you a couple of things stand out to me. One is you've got to have some ethics and morals mm -hmm. kind of right. ingrained in yourself. You're going to be faced with a lot of hard decisions, a lot of hard choices. The solution is not going to be evident to you right away. Uh, but you've got to have some morals that you stick to, something that guides you through mm -hmm. those hard times that I think will lead you to the right decision uh, with the help of some, you know, some trusted advisors and others. So if you don't have a good moral compass, yeah. uh, it's going to be a difficult, I, I found it was, it was very going to be a very difficult road to hoe, so to speak. So uh, that that's one. Two is uh, particularly coming out of college and if you want to get into, you know, government service and the mm -hmm. like. You be prepared to be a little flexible. Uh, mm, I often right. say be be prepared to be uncomfortable mm. uh, in the sense of I think a lot of folks coming out of college right now and, and others out of higher education, they want to chart their path, right? They right. want to know they're they're hey, I'm going to do this in four years, this in eight years yeah. and, and kind of have their career mapped out for them. Rarely have I seen that work. Uh, right. It may work if you go to law school and you want to be a partner. Maybe you can set some time frames around mm -hmm. that, um, but uh, you know, just you, you got to make some good decisions. You got to surround yourself with the right people, mm -hmm. but then stay a little flexible. Mm -hmm. Take some risk uh, when you need to. I, I did that on several occasions throughout my career. I joined DHS back in 2003 without really knowing what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. I, I made that same. Uh, I repeated that again in 2017 when. Um, as a father of, of two young kids, I, uh, I took a job in the Trump administration, not knowing what I would do or what I was going to be paid, but I knew it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. I knew that the country needed some help and some leadership, particularly inside the Department of Homeland Security. And so I almost felt it was like a calling to do that. Uh, but that, that risk was informed by a set of decisions. And it wasn't just, I'm jumping into it blindly. I was, I was making an educated guess, but yeah. You know, I would say that a lot of people might feel uncomfortable doing that. And, and I would say throughout your career, whether it's just starting or whether you're several years into it, sometimes you have to make some calculated risk and you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable for certain mm -hmm. periods of your of your career. 
Well, yeah. and that's such a powerful piece of advice. I, and I agree. So many of the students we talk to, they're looking, they, they, they want the one, two, three step process yeah. from now till death, right? Like all the way, <laughs> yeah. they want to have it all ticked out. I want to have it all picked out. And that's just not the way life oh works. Goodness, and I right. love the way that you talked about principles, that you can navigate life, you can have a, a level of flexibility when you're not leading by a path, by a structure, but by following specific principles you have in your life. Tell us a little bit about how you developed those principles. What was that moment where you realized, okay, this is something solid I could stand on versus maybe some of the other things in your life you thought were solid that you're like, ah, no, I can, I can flex on that. Well, it's a good question. I'm not sure if it was ever that one period of time. Mm. Look, I grew up in the in the Catholic Church, so I have a certain background yep. and a certain set of morals and principles that I take with me. But I think every job that I've had, I've tried to learn from it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's another piece of advice, right? right. So you always, I, I think everyone, you, you know, you're always working for someone, doesn't matter who it is at mm -hmm. the end of the day. And you take pluses and minuses from those individuals and you say to yourself, hey, if I ever get the chance to lead, oh. if I ever get the chance to be in a position, I'm going to do things differently. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, you know, treat subordinates this way and not this way. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're constantly learning, even though you may be leading uh, an office or mm -hmm. you may be leading three people, you're constantly learning as you lead. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're either writing that down, and in my case, I, I wrote that down wow. uh, for years and years at a time, or you're just making mental notes of it to saying, look, if I ever get the chance, here's how I'm going to communicate to the folks that that are looking up to me to lead them. Here's here's kind of the principles, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to them in a certain way. So for me, it was always... I always thought that I would be leading um, some some type of organization. I never thought it would be the Department of Homeland Security, mm -hmm. but I always thought that I would be in that position. Um, and I started to really from day one is how do I how do I learn to get to that right? That's that's usually experience that unless you're just a gifted individual to begin with and have a you know a great sense of who you are, that usually has to be built up over a number of years. And so you're always mm -hmm. learning, you're always honing your skill even though, you know, it, it may not be something specific, right? I go mm -hmm. back to, you may not be, you know, teaching a class, you're mm -hmm. not honing those types of skills, you're honing, you're honing different skill sets. How do you communicate with individuals? How do you bring people along? How do you build an argument? How do you build a budget? Mm -hmm. How do you mm -hmm. uh, get people to go along with you if they don't want to? So you're, you're constantly building that skill set over time. And the, the best way to do that is just look at people around you, not only your own supervisor or your own boss or who you might work for, but also other leaders uh, mm -hmm. within your organization or outside organizations. I would look and still to this to this day, listen to a number of books, usually on tape when I'm driving somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, different leadership books, mm -hmm. um, because you may not, you know, look, I may listen to, you know, a lot of these books are very long, but you may listen to 13 hours. But if you only pull away two right. points in 13 right. hours, yep. it's, it's 13 hours well spent. And then you build on that year over year. So you become and you start to develop your own set of, leadership skills over time. And I think that's, um, it, it's not only fun, but it's interesting. Yeah. And speaking of looking around at leaders, I mean, you've, you've had a variety of leaders that you've had the privilege yeah. to serve under. Can you tell us about the principles you've learned from leaders like, um, uh, former president Bush and, and president Trump? Well, there's a, there's a whole host of, of mm -hmm. leaders uh, that I've learned from. And it's not just obviously the two presidents, but, uh, many other individuals, you know, they come in different categories. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Some folks I've learned, uh, some individuals I work for that have just been really, really intelligent. Mm -hmm. Just those folks that you would love to sit down and, and have those conversations with. But I've also found that some of those individuals have a difficult time leading teams mm -hmm. uh, because they, they're not able to articulate, you know, what they're thinking and their vision into actionable uh, results. So um, what I've learned from folks that are really smart in intelligence is how to attack a problem and how to think about it on all sides uh, mm -hmm. to come to the, to the right uh, sort of answer at the end of the day, and then how to defend your answer uh, to others and really be having that analytical, analytical mm -hmm. uh, mind that you need to have, at least in this, uh, in the, mm -hmm. the right. type of work that I do and that policy analysis type of work. So you're always looking at what are the principles I want to uh, mm -hmm. advocate for, but then what are, what are my critics going to say about it? And how do I build that into my analysis as I continue to talk about a certain issue? Yeah. There's other leaders, as you mentioned, President Trump obviously comes to mind that talks about, you know, I would say leadership from a different perspective. It's, mm -hmm. you know, having a businessman, you know, lead a, a federal government was very unique. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and what we learned from him was, you know, the, the, the results matter. Right. Uh, the American people and, and anyone else don't don't want to know why you can't do things. Mm. They just want you to get the mission done. And so, yep. you know, sometimes you have to break some China. Yeah. You have to upset right. some people. Yeah. You have to upset the apple yeah. cart yeah. to get things done. I, I remember there there used to be a time in my career and it was early on where if someone was upset with me, I, I took that personally. Mm. I, I said, well, why is someone upset with me? I, I feel like I'm doing the right thing. And I think over time, particularly in the in sort of in the mm public sector in the, you know, having a public life, that just comes with the territory. And and again, it it goes back to being uncomfortable, being comfortable, being uncomfortable. I'm okay now that people disagree with me that don't like me. (laughs) Right. Um, (laughs) At the end of the day, there's, we're a big country. We've got a lot of different views. Right. Uh, But I, I, in my heart of hearts, I know what I advocate for and the positions I take are right. uh, At least from, from my principal standpoint. And that's okay if people disagree with yeah, me and, yeah. you know, they can, they can come yeah. after me. They can even attack me. Mm-hmm. That's not going to change my opinion and my voice. Yeah. So, so good. We're going to move into our fire round. I want to ask you just a few quick questions surrounding kind of everything that we've just discussed and, and just uh, want your answer from your gut. We want to grab a few practical and applicable <laughs> okay. pieces of advice for, oh boy. for all of our experiences. We only have three quick questions. Michael, you fire the first one away. All right. Fire off. What's one piece of advice if you could go back and give to your 21-year-old self, you would tell them? Wow. Uh, I probably would say, um, I wouldn't say study harder in school. I feel like I studied pretty <laughs> good. good. Yeah. Um, I, w- I would say um, build that network of, of friends and yes. colleagues. Yeah, that's uh, I'm not sure I did that enough when I was just graduating from college and, mm-hmm. and, and really working, but it, building that network is so critical. You just mm-hmm. never know where your life is going to take you, where your career is going to take you, and where other people will land in life. Mm-hmm how they can be helpful and how you can be helpful for them. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what, you know, living is about, uh, I, you know, is about your experiences and the people, you know. Yeah, that's good. What encouragement would you give to leaders who are facing backlash in the public eye? Uh, it goes back to having that, that set of uh, that, that inner compass, that inner moral compass. Yeah. Um, do what you know is right. What you believe is right. Uh, morally, ethically, um, is right and stick to it, knowing that you're going to get some criticism. Um, answer all the criticism with fact, uh, with evidence-based fact, um, and let the facts stand for themselves. Yeah. As I as I used to say, facts don't lie; they are mm-hmm. what they are. Yeah, absolutely. People can disagree with them. People can say, "Well, that may be the fact, but I still think you're doing the wrong thing." Well, that's fine. Mm-hmm. That's just an opinion, yeah. um, and there's a lot of different opinions out there. So, once you take a position. That's based in fact that you can back up, that you can argue, stick with it. Mm. Yeah. I love it. Love it. Last, last question for us as we're sitting down. If there's, what do you think is one leadership principle is contributing to the most success you're having right now at AFP? Um, well, I would say it's servant leadership, right? Mm. Um, and I get, I get that question a lot, both at AFPI mm. as well as at DHS, which is, what is your leadership style? I used to get mm. that a lot. That's actually a question that Congress asked me yeah. as I was being confirmed, which is, what is your leadership style? And at the time, I said, well, there's nothing that I won't ask any any person under me or that's serving mm. with me to do that I won't do myself. Mm. Um, and so what that meant at DHS, and it kind of relates here to AFPI, is uh, I always tried to be the first in and the mm. last out. Um, I always tried to read as much as I could, know as much as I could about every mm-hmm. individual office and issue within the department and now at AFPI so that I could be just as knowledgeable as they were, uh, mm-hmm. never knowing, not, not, you're always not going to be as knowledgeable as the expert, mm-hmm. uh, but you want to be able to have a good conversation with them about the issues. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say dive in. Mm-hmm. And even though you may be leading an, an organization, uh, you got to put in the hard work uh, mm-hmm. so that your your colleagues mm-hmm. and those underneath you can see that you're putting in the hard work. Uh, and I think that pays off. Yeah. Love well, it. Well said. Well, Chad, I want to thank you for joining us today on Framework yeah. Leadership. Uh, I, you know, thank you for your service mm-hmm. and, and the servant heart that you have. There's no doubt. And, and people see that in the way you lead. Uh, you put you put people first. You put the American people first. Yeah. It's not all about self. And uh, and so we're so grateful for your leadership. So thank you for uh, right. serving and being in this role. If you want to stay up to date with Chad, you can follow him on Instagram at Real Chad Wolf and check out more about AFPI at AmericaFirstPolicy.com. Have a great week, everybody. 
Thank you so much for joining us today on Framework Leadership. If you're watching on YouTube right now, now would be a great time to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button so you can get more leadership content right into your YouTube feed. You can also check us out on Instagram at Kent underscore Engel at Dr. Michael Steiner or on Twitter and YouTube at Kent Engel. And hey, if you love great email newsletters, and I know that I do, you want to check out the Framework Leadership Newsletter. Every single Friday drops in great tips to be a better leader, resources, thoughts right into your inbox. Check it out. You can sign up at kentingle.com. Make sure you hop on to there. Thank you so much for listening to Framework Leadership. Take care, everybody.